we have played the game Pony Adventure 3 a little bit. We have set up our own server and we investigate the game from a higher level perspective which led us to discover a libgamelogic binary, which is a dynamic library loaded by the game and sounds important. So now we go another layer deeper, we get our hands dirty and open a disassembler. So which disassembler should we use? There is Binary Ninja, which is developed by the creators of this game. Unfortunately, the demo version does not support 64-bit, so you have to have a regular license. But it costs just like as much as 3 video games, so it's not too bad. Then recently IDA released a new freeware version with 64-bit support, and that's awesome and definitely something you should try. And then there's also Hopper and Radare. I will mostly use Binary Ninja and IDA for this project now, but in general, as you know from my videos, I use them all. As I'm not doing professional work with reverse engineering, my experience on this topic is very limited. I just try to make things work. If you have tips and tricks and advice how to do things better, let me know. I most certainly would like to get better. So let's open the lib game logic in Binary Ninja and IDA. It takes a few seconds to analyze and process the binary, but very quickly we can see that it identifies a lot of interesting symbol names. You might have also noticed that there are some very weird function names. This is immediately telling me that this is a C++ program. These are so called mangled names and we can demangle them. This cryptic string encodes a much more complex name including the types. If you carefully analyze it and play around with it, you can figure some things out about the format. For example, the number here is the length of the name, while the small c stands for char. Changing that into an i makes the argument an integer instead. So this demangled representation is much more readable and also unveils classes. So there exists a game API class, which has a function with the name getSpawnPoints. And that function takes a constant character pointer, that's basically a string. This information, these names, are included because they are exported symbols and the binary is not stripped. So it's super awesome and easy for us to explore the functionalities and capabilities of the client. But before we go on with this, I want to make two points. First, this game was part of a CTF that was running for maybe two days. So giving out the names of these functions is a huge speed boost. This makes it much easier for people to understand the game and allow them to focus on the actual challenges rather than having to spend a lot of time on intensive reversing. Which leads me to my second point. Yes, it would be easy to make it more time consuming and thus maybe harder for attackers if the binary would be stripped, because that is a significant time sink. But a group doing reverse engineering can recover all of this class information, obviously not exact names, but they will understand everything as if they had the names, it just takes time. And by that I mean hundreds or maybe thousands of man hours. But it's a one time investment. Once a group has reverse engineered the internal class structure, then they essentially are at the point where we are now. So even if it might be a bit unrealistic that we have this debug information, it just saves us time. It doesn't mean it were impossible otherwise. And to be honest, it might not be that unrealistic after all. For example, a popular MMORPG had an open beta before their launch where they shipped a debug build of the game, including all the information. And yes, for the release they stripped out all of the stuff which made the game also run fast, but at this point the attackers, I, I don't want to call them attackers, they don't try to attack, they just research how the game works, had all the information they needed. Of course, over the time, the binary changed and also classes changed a lot, new features were added or removed, but that is extremely valuable information that helps with future reversing. And even now, when you get a crash in that game, you often get an assert condition, which reveals some internal code information. And these asserts are embedded in the game binary, so it's super easy to map out what functions do based on that. So my point is, if you try this on another game, you might not have all these classes and names included, which doesn't make it impossible, it just means you have to do a lot of work first. Anyway, this is not about doing anything to real games, we are just having fun with an intentionally vulnerable game hacking challenge. Let's go back to the disassembler and keep looking around. There is so much to learn here, so many interesting classes and functions. For example, there is a submit DLC key function. 
Remember the chest on the pirate ship that wanted the DLC key? Let's check the boat. Is that a chest as well? I don't trust it. Oh, <laughs> DLC. I'm sure that is the function that is handling that. By the way, the orange color is how the game would call a function. It's from the procedure linkage table. What that is, I have touched on in a video linked here. You see, it's a jump to an address contained in the global offset table. The actual implemented code is in the white colored version here. So here's a submit DLC key function from the game server connection class. And it seems to get a function pointer to something and calls server connection server and queue. So sounds like it places this action into a queue to be then sent to the server. And yeah, the server and queue function just acquires a lock to prevent race conditions on the queue and then pushes a new item into that queue. So somewhere is a consumer of that queue and based on that class name server connection, I'm sure it will build a packet to send to the server. You can easily spend a couple of hours just learning about different functions and objects and it's really fun, you should try it yourself. I won't tell you each discovery, but here for example we have class Magma Rock. That was the boss monster in that cave which healed itself and the function get display name it references a fixed string as name. And that name led me into a section with lots of other strings of the game. And there it says find all of the golden eggs. Interesting, so there are golden eggs somewhere. Let's compare a little bit how this looks like in Ida. So Ida also demangles these names. For example, there is a client handler that seems to be responsible for handling chat messages. We can also look at the export specifically, sort by name and get a nice list of all the stuff that exists. Ida also can detect these structures. So for example, here it found an actor class. So Ida says it's a struct, not a class, but classes are essentially just made out of structs. If you program C++ and C, they might feel very different, especially with inheritance and public-private visibilities and methods and attributes, but in the end, the underlying implementation is essentially just a struct with some more information like a vtable pointer. And it found some attributes like ID, target, health and more. It even found some cross-references from some code. Ida also found some enums, for example, item rarity and damage types. So after just scrolling around and reading a lot of the class names and functions, I decided to look at this in GDB. So I launched a game, head into the game so that everything would be loaded, and then I attach GDB to it. In GDB, we can also list all the running threads. We could even do info variables to get all the available variable names or info functions or info types, but this is a huge program, so there's just endless amounts of data, which makes it super difficult to find useful stuff. But from the disassemblers, we know a lot of interesting functions. For example, there were functions related to jumping, like the game server connection jump, and we can set a breakpoint there. When we now jump in game, the breakpoint is hit. And we also see the call stack, at least partially for the functions we know inside of libgamelogic. So the actual game client called player set jump state, which called then client world jump, which triggered a server connection regarding the jump, probably informing the server that we press jump. Super cool, huh? We can also use some other cool GDB features such as p type, print type. So print the type of player, and player is a class we know exists, and GDB prints the whole player class. So we can see that the class player inherits from actor and iPlayer, which probably stands for interface player, and the player class itself has a player name, a team name, and much more. So now you can explore all these classes easily with GDB P type. Here's the game server connection class, which inherits from server connection class. And in the server connection class, we can see the server and queue function again, which takes the function pointer we mentioned earlier. Pretty neat. One other thing I discovered was in the data section of the binary. There's a global variable called game world, along with some other very interesting variables called g items and g eggs and so forth. We can then print that in GDB. Print game world shows that this variable is a pointer to a world object. And if we dereference that pointer, we get the actual world object and GDB prints that. So we have here the world object, which does include, for example, a list of players, but currently there's only one, me. 
There's also a VPTR to client world. That's a VTable pointer. That's what I briefly mentioned before. So I think this object here is in fact not a world object, but a client world object. We can also access attributes of the world object, for example, the players list. Or we can cast the world pointer to a client world pointer in dereference that, which is basically the same. It's of course similar to the world object, but we also get a variable active player. And that variable was only part of client world. So I guess that is us. And again, we can print the class definition of this with p type. And you see here, there's a private attribute called active player, which is from the type actor ref. So I guess actor reference, but with the underlying type i player. I don't know why it's programmed that way, but essentially it's a reference to our player object. And you know what we can do? We can now extract all of these classes from GDB and create a C header file called libgamelogic which we can then use for creating our first actual game hack. But that has to wait for the next video.